Today, we're starting a new project. We're making over a 93 Silverado into an awesome street truck. But with more than a quarter million miles on this truck's clock, there's a lot of work to do. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. Well, today we're getting started on a brand new project that we picked up for cheap. This is a regular cab short box 93 Chevy with a 350 under the hood and over a quarter of a million miles on it. Now, normally we kind of give you guys a tour around the vehicle when we kick off a project, isolate some of the problem areas and plan out some cool modifications. But before we modify anything on this turd, we're going to make sure that it's roadworthy, reliable and safe. Okay, now you got kind of a game of name your fluids here. Obviously engine oil here and that, well it's transmission fluid. There's several of the major components that are leaking. So we're gonna address them one by one, walk you through it. So we systematically attacked the leaks and started with probably the most obvious leak and the easiest one to get to, which is the rear differential seal. Okay, so the first thing you see here is that some kind of fluid has been seeping around the wheel studs. Pull the drum off, take a quick look. The surface area is really nice. There's no grooves in it, and there's plenty of material left on the drum itself. The pad's in good shape, so the brakes are basically functional. Something's seeping out, and if you look right up in here, it's an axle seal. All right, while we let the gear oil drain out of the differential, I went ahead and pulled the drum off the driver's side. The side Kevin pulled off looked to be in good shape, and the shoes did as well. This side, not so much. It looks like the shoes were worn so bad that the rivets holding the friction material in place actually wore into the drum surface. And it looks like the grooves are too deep to be machined out, so these drums are going to have to be replaced. The shoes, well, they need to be replaced as well, but it's for a couple of reasons. Not just because they have a weird wear pattern because of the grooves in the drum, but because it looks like we've got some gear oil leaking on here from a bad axle seal, and it looks like maybe some brake fluid from a bad wheel cylinder. Let's check it out. And upon closer inspection, we definitely have some leaking seals in the wheel cylinder. And this fuzzy stuff you see on top is the shoe material mixing with the gear oil and the brake fluid. We need to get rid of it because nobody wants that in their lungs. So a quick wash down with brake clean gets it done. Let that dry and we can pull the axle shaft out. Pulling the axles is pretty simple. It starts with the differential center pin retaining bolt, which comes out and then the center pin typically just falls right out in your hand. From this point, the spider gears walk out quite easily and then a simple push of the axle shaft inward releases the C-clip, which you can retrieve with a magnet. Pretty simple. Then the axle shafts can easily be extracted from the axle housing without affecting the rest of the carrier. Now they do make special brake drum pliers and tools just for this job, but you can typically get by with just some common hand tools that you probably already own. And if you're not too familiar with working on drum brakes, we'll just leave the other side completely assembled. That way you have a reference. And these wheel cylinders, well, they are rebuildable, but it's usually not cost or time effective to do so. That is, unless you've got some rare vehicle where a rebuilt one's not available. Uh, it's still got a bunch of nasty in there. All right, now it's a good idea to loosen up the brake line connection to the wheel cylinder before you unbolt it from the backing plate so it doesn't try to spin on you. We also plugged the end of the brake line to make sure all the fluid didn't drain out of the line. It would just make bleeding the brakes take that much longer. Now, a little bit of water neutralizes the brake fluid and a little bit of brake clean washes everything down and dries quick so we have a clean dry surface to work with. Now the new wheel cylinder obviously fits right in place and just retained by two bolts. Tighten them down then attach your brake line. Now, reassembling the shoes is somewhat straightforward but these little coil springs that keep the shoes pinned down to the backing plate can be a pain in the neck. They've got to be compressed a good little bit and then rotated 90 degrees until the retainer clip seats. At least that'll hold it in position. Then you just repeat the process on the other brake shoe and then we just completed the installation with all the springs and small parts that came in our hardware kit. Again, using the passenger side drum as a reference. Now the axle seal was leaking, 
So we used our seal puller to remove it. And it was pretty happy where it was. You can also use a pry bar or even a screwdriver if you have to to remove these things. Just takes a little bit of work. There we go. Ooh, yum. And be prepared to lose a little bit of gear oil in the process. And if I was a little bit smarter, I would replace the axle seal first before I did the brake shoes. But oh well, no harm, no foul. Now tapping in the seal, you just want to be careful and not damage the seal in the process. We're using a little plastic face hammer. And a little bit of gear oil on the seal will prevent damage during reassembly. Just make sure you don't catch the sharp splines of the end of the axle shaft on the seal causing damage. With the axle shaft pushed a little further than its normal seated position, it easily exposes the grooves for the C-clips, which can be inserted again with a magnet and the axles pulled back into place, ready for the spider gears. Now this can be kind of a trick in a tongue twister. You've got to time them to where they're parallel and line up with the bore for the center shaft. A couple of stabs usually gets it right. Then you just insert the retaining bolt, snug it up, and you're rocking. With the diff cover sealed up, you've got a couple of choices on how to refill it with gear oil. We chose to let compressed air do the work rather than the forearm squeeze of the quart jugs into the diff itself. The Motive Products Power Fill makes it easy. Hey, welcome back. Now that we've got the rear axle refurbished and new brakes on, we threw a coat of paint on the raw casting drums just to keep the rust off. And since there's no shortage of issues and problems on this truck, let's move on to the next one. All right, now like Kevin said, this truck has no shortage of issues. And up front, we've got play in the steering and either the ball joints or the wheel bearing. Probably just a wheel bearing adjustment. But if I look through the wheel, looks like we might have some brake issues as well. All right, now this rotor's got more grooves in it than our camera guy Rob's favorite Bee Gees record. And on the outer lip, well, it's pretty worn there too, meaning this rotor's probably well past its minimum thickness specification. Now the pads look like they're about half life left, but they probably worn to match the grooves in the rotor. So we're gonna be replacing both. Plus it'll give us a chance to adjust these wheel bearings. All right, now this brake pad is obviously wearing to match the rotor. The inside edge and the outside edge are wearing on the lip as the pad eats into the face of the rotor. Now the face of the pad is grooved just like the rotor is. So this one brake pad is not staying alive. Now it's kind of hard to see, but the minimum thickness is cast into the rotor. So we can measure the face of the rotor and determine if it can be turned or machined or if it's scrap. Now minimum spec is 30.86 and in our case, well, we're obviously well below that, and that's before removing any material from the machining process. So these are scrapping. We need new rotors. Now, before we install our new rotors, we're going to be installing some new wheel bearings that we picked up from LMC Truck. And they do make a bearing packer tool that makes this job a little bit quicker, but I like doing it by hand, and it frankly doesn't take that long. We install our freshly packed bearing into the rotor, followed by the spindle seal and it just gets lightly tapped into place. And when installing it on the spindle, make sure you're careful not to tear the edge of the spindle seal on the threads of the end of the spindle. Now to set the bearing preload, I like to spin the rotor while tightening it down. Once you're happy with the bearing preload, just back off the castellated nut until the cotter key lines up, stab it, bend over one leg, and add the dust cap. All right, with our wheel bearings all adjusted, we can top off our new Duralast rotors with some Duralast brake pads. Okay, so the steering linkage assembly looks about as bad as it is. Start over here. Outer tie rod end, worn out. Inner tie rod end, worn out. Same on the other side. So obviously that stuff has to be replaced. But look a little deeper. The pitman arm, 
well, it doesn't feel like it's sloppy. The idler, same thing, doesn't feel like it's sloppy. However, 260,000 miles, chances are by the looks of this stuff, it has not been replaced. And one thing I learned in collision repair is that you cannot get an accurate wheel alignment if your pitman arm and your idler are sloppy. If they have even a little bit of play in them, it needs to be replaced and you owe it to yourself and your new set of tires to do that. So that's what we're gonna do today. Now, caked up schmutz covering the joints actually helps with tear down because it stops things from rusting. So this actually came apart pretty easily. Your goal here is to mock up the tie rod to approximately the same length as the original. We're using a new adjustment sleeve just because they're inexpensive and it makes it easier. Exposing the threads helps you dial in the length and this is pretty much self-explanatory, but will help you in aligning your truck once it's on the ground. That is pretty close. You may need to use a little persuasion to get the idler and the pitman arm out of the main center lane, but it also serves as a little bit of therapy whooping up on it. Now, after a bath in the parts washer, the blast cabinet really cleans up the center link and allows for a coat of paint just to make it look good, help a little bit of the corrosion. From there, your idler and your pitman arm just get bolted in place and the rest of the assembly mocked up, ready for reinstallation. Hey, welcome back. Well, the new steering linkage back up and in place and adjusted to just about exactly the same length as it was when we disassembled it from the vehicle. So it should be pretty good for a tow and go once the vehicle's on its own weight. Take a closer look up here, something else we replaced. Another thing that was causing sloppy steering in the wandering truck syndrome was this steering shaft right here in the rag joint. It was completely worn out. So we called up LMC and had them send us one of their replacements for this truck. That should just about take care of the steering. Now you may have noticed one thing we're not replacing is the steering box itself. Since it wasn't leaking and it wasn't sloppy, it stays. All right, now every time we move this truck around the shop after it's been sitting for anything more than just a few minutes and it leaves a little red spot of transmission fluid. And at first we were thinking, great, it's gonna be a hassle and it's gonna be messy, but it turns out we may be getting lucky. So you can see it's dripping out of the transmission tail housing, but I think it's coming from this speed sensor here. And if that's the case, it should be a pretty cheap an easy fix. The first thing we need to do is disconnect the electrical pigtail and then remove the retaining bolt that keeps the speed sensor locked in place. And we do have a good bit of oil all over the tail housing, but it looks like it's probably all coming from this leaky speed sensor O-ring. It's not the easiest thing to remove. Heck, it's been there for quite a while and it's kind of comfortable where it is. Come on, baby. and make sure that you have a catch pan ready because you are going to lose a little bit of ATF. Yep, looks like we just need a new O-ring. Now after cleaning off our speed sensor, we could easily see the hardened O-ring that needed to be replaced. An old pocket screwdriver dug it out of the channel it's living in so it can be replaced with a new one that we picked up from the parts store for just a couple of bucks. Make sure you wipe off the speed sensor before reinstallation. You don't want to get any of that nasty gunk inside of your transmission. A little bit of the clean ATF that's coming out of this thing will lubricate the O-ring seal so it slides into place a little bit more easily. Although it probably will take a couple of taps from a little plastic hammer to make it happen. Just don't get carried away. And simply reinstall the bolt Attach your electrical harness, clean off the area, and test for leaks. Sometimes repairs don't get cheaper or easier than that. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, we've done a bunch of chassis maintenance on this old truck, but now we want to focus our attention on some of the underhood stuff. And like we've told you, this thing's got over 260,000 miles on it. So it's safe to assume that anything that's going to wear out probably is worn out. So we're going to do some freshening up. To do that, we picked up a new serpentine belt and tensioner, 
a new oil filter, air filter, some fresh E3 spark plugs, Excel cap and rotor, and plug wires from Summit Racing. And we're going to replace this tiny little baby battery that's only got 525 cold cranking amps with this Duralast battery with a little bit more vehicle appropriate 700 cold cranking amps. Now the first thing we're going to do is remove the spark plugs. And you can take a look at the old spark plugs and it'll give you an idea of the condition of that cylinder. And honestly, ours looked like it was burning a little bit of oil, but you'd expect that from a truck with this kind of mileage on it. Our Matco spark plug swivel socket makes the installation easy. All right, now before you take all your old plug wires and toss them in the trash, do yourself a favor and find the longest one, coil it up and put it in the glove box or the console. That way, in case any of the new plug wires get burned on the exhaust manifold or something, you'll have a spare that'll get you home. Now when replacing a distributor cap or replacing plug wires, it's always a good idea to mark the location of the plug wires and which cylinder they go to before you disassemble. If you're not too familiar with the engine, you never know, the previous owner may have installed the distributor backwards or something crazy like that. And on GM distributors of this year range, well, there's two electrical connectors as well. And add the plug wires. And to make sure the new plug wires don't fuse themselves to the spark plug insulators, I'm going to add a little bit of dielectric grease. We'll make sure they come on and off without tearing. Now at first glance, this distributor cap seems to be in decent shape. It's not that old and it's been replaced at some time. But upon further inspection, it's clear we've had some moisture down in here and there's corrosion on all of the terminals. Not good for spark energy. Now the serpentine belt is just starting to show signs of wear, so in the spirit of basic maintenance, we're going to replace it. Now the pulley for the tensioner, it's a little sloppy, so we're just going to go ahead and replace the whole tensioner since it was available as a unit. But just like what Ryan said, spare is not a bad idea, especially with the serpentine belt because you got one shot if it breaks. So this is going behind the seat of the truck. The next time you see this truck, it gets a lowering kit. If you've got an F-Series pickup with a 6.2 gas burner and you want to dress up under hood without going aftermarket, well now you can. These stylish covers fit all 6.2 F-150 and Super Duty trucks, including Raptor. They're made of powder-coated aluminum and come in several different colors, including silver, blue, and black, and feature the time-honored and much-respected Powered by Ford script on top. They're sold in pairs and shipped just like you see them, including fasteners, cam position sensor grommets, and Brand new gaskets they are available wherever Ford Racing products are sold. Hey guys, if you've got a Dana 60 front axle underneath your truck that uses traditional jam nuts to set the spindle bearing preload and you want to get rid of those outdated jam nuts and go with something a little bit more permanent, well you need to check out the Stage 8 X-Lock spindle nut. A notched washer fits on top of the thrust washer, followed by a grooved spindle nut and a locking retainer that is positively held in place with a snap ring, guaranteeing that spindle nut will never back off. Now, Stage 8 claims they've got over 10 million installations without a single failure. So if you're tired of jam nuts, check out the X-Lock spindle nut. The cooler your transmission runs, the cleaner the fluid stays, and the longer the transmission lives. That's why Pacific Performance Engineering has come out with this heavy-duty, deep-sump, finned aluminum pan for Allison transmissions. They're made in the USA with the thick casting and fins that double as a heat sink. Comes with a race weight stainless steel plug that's magnetized to keep particles from surfacing and are drilled with quarter inch and eighth inch NPT ports, making it a snap for an external temperature probe. The deep pan comes with a deep filter and fasteners. You can pick yours up from Summit Racing. Thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you guys soon.